So today's sermon, the title pretty much tells you where the sermon is going today. Drop pride to lay hold of the prize. Drop pride to lay hold of the prize. You can't have both. You're going to have to drop one to lay hold of the other. So let's go back to our scripture. Our primary scripture today is from Luke's gospel, where we've been preaching from. I'll pick up where Dean left off last Sunday in Luke chapter 11, verse 53. We're going to read through chapter 12, verse 3. And we'll come back to the beginning of 12 next week, I believe. So here we go. Hear now God's word. And as he left there, this means Jesus. And remember, he's been at a luncheon to which he was invited by a Pharisee, and the thing has gone really rough. Jesus has thrown out denunciations against the Pharisees, and then three woes against Pharisees, and three woes against the scribes. He's really giving final stage warnings, calling these people to real wake up and repentance type thing. As he left there, the scribes and Pharisees began to hold a terrible grudge against him. That's the way I would translate the Greek there. Uh, the knows and Achaean, it, it's really talking about grudging hostility, pressing against Jesus. They began to hold a terrible grudge against him and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait. You hear how they sound like just vicious animals now? Lying in wait for him to trap him in something coming out of his mouth. Now, uh, what's marked off is chapter 12. Picking up at verse 1, in these times, in other words, with all this tension going on, in this context, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he's got these huge crowds coming to hear him. He, Jesus, began to say to his disciples first, the first thing he's going to say to them and follow up, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed. The word there, by the way, is the same as the apocalypse, of, like the final book of the Bible, right? Revealed. The unveiling will be revealed. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Working back through the last three sermons and the segments of scripture, we've been on the latter part of Luke chapter 11. I'll go backwards. First, last Sunday, Dean preached an excellent sermon on Luke 11, verses 45 through 52. How do we protect ourselves from false teachers? So that was really a message to us on discerning teaching and teachers. Very important for parents, for youth, for all of us in the church family. The previous Sunday, September 29th, I preached a sermon, Baptize and Give from the Inside Out. Uh, looking at Luke chapter 11, verses 34 through 44, and thinking about what it means to be clean from the inside out, and conversely, what it would mean to be truly defiled. It wasn't about the religious rituals, Jesus said. It wasn't about this, all this you know, performance with the washing. It was about being clean from the inside. And then, yes, on the outside, too. You should tithe also. You should do these things also, Jesus says. But first, you need the Holy Spirit to clean you on the inside. But then the previous Sunday, September the 22nd, I preached a sermon called Jesus' Riddle of the Eye, and the subtitle, which is where I want to go back to today, is What You See is What You Will Get. The way you see life, the way you see yourself, the way you see things, the way you discern your perspective, your perception governs everything for you. What you see is what you'll get now and at the judgment. That's what Jesus says. And the key verse there, Luke 11, 34. The lamp of the body is your eye. The lamp of the body is your eye. When your eye is good, and the word there for good was hapus, 
in the Greek, which means like singly focused and open and or generous. If your eye is generous, open, gracious. Jesus says, yeah, the light's coming in and out. It's coming out of you to other people and the light is coming into you from me. If your lamp is good, open, generous, also your whole body's full of light. But when it is bad, Jesus says, poneros, evil, you know, grudging, stingy, looking a lot of different ways to get your own angle at things, not, not wholly open. When it's squinty, when it's bad, also your body is full of darkness, Jesus said. So I think that message is echoing through how we can understand what is happening in these transitional verses that I just read about having a good eye, a generous eye, an open eye, an eye of grace, or a bad eye, a stingy, a grudging eye. And here's the thing on the perception. Back to pride. Pride is really dangerous because pride prevents your being saved. Pride blocks salvation. Pride is going to block salvation because it keeps us from seeing the depth of our sin. Okay, remember the I thing. Pride blurs us so we don't see the depth of our own sin and it prevents us from seeing the one true Savior, Jesus. See, think about all the people who had Jesus right in front of them and they don't see who he is. I mean, how tragic, right? Because pride's going to get in the way. I'll come back to that, but that's what we're looking at uh, from the scripture here. Pride prevents salvation because we look at ourselves via our own selfies. <laughs> and I can look pretty good, right? Um, or via false stars and influencers who are showing us how wonderful they are. And, and you know, if I'm looking at influencers instead of Jesus, is that a good thing spiritually or a bad thing? It's a bad thing, right? I got my eyes on the wrong thing. I'm looking towards the wrong thing instead of the one true Savior. So let's look at the two different spectrums here for a moment. Pride leads irreligious people, you know, irreligious people, to deny God or to thumb their noses at God because they're so proud of their intellectual agnosticism or their intellectual freedom or their sexual freedom or whatever, their identity. I'm pursuing my own identity. This is what my life is about. And all my social media posts and all my friends need to affirm my identity and my freedom. It's all about me. That's pride of irreligious people, right? Or people who say they're religious, but they're really kind of playing the irreligious game, right? But let's go over a little bit closer to home for some of us. What about for religious people? Pride leads many religious people to trust in their religious traditions and religious performance, or just to be a little bit tough, like Jesus, play acting, religious play acting. And, and by the way, on the religious play acting, I can take you to the full spectrum, all the way over to high church kind of people who are really good at liturgy and meditation and stuff like this, all the way over to very contemporary charismatic people who are performing with their hands up and clapping and woo, I don't care whichever way you want to go, we're talking performance, right? Putting my pride and my trust in performance and my traditions, whether that's low church, high church, I don't care what your tradition is, to deny that we are all sinners, as much sinners as the irreligious in the eyes of a holy God. And we all need to repent. If I'm proud, I'm not going to repent whether I'm irreligious or religious. We need to drop our pride, our prejudices. Come on, admit it. We all have prejudices, right? Our grudges so that our eyes can open up to see who we are in the light of Jesus and to look to Jesus alone. So today's sermon again, drop pride to lay hold of the pride. So three movements here, and we'll come back over these. Number one, drop pride in traditions and status to enter the kingdom as a newborn. You don't have anything. You're entering as a newborn, okay? 
drop pride in traditions and status. Number two, drop pride in grudges to be open to grace and generosity. Drop, number three, drop all prideful play acting and presumption to lay hold of the prize. So I was reflecting on this, and we need some guidance here because Jesus is giving us warnings, which is really important. But can we get a positive example? So this doesn't take you long to figure this out. If we think about the Pharisees who, at the end of Luke chapter 11 and beginning of Luke chapter 12, are rejecting Jesus and really holding a grudge against him and wanting to knock him off now. Who's a Pharisee who ends up following Jesus? Anybody know the answer to that? Saul of Tarsus, otherwise known as Paul. So let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, second part of verse 4 through verse 14. I'm going to require you to work with me on Paul for a minute here or a couple times, but he really gives us guidance. Okay, this is a personal testimony type guidance that he gives, putting things in perspective on how to see things. So this is from Philippians chapter 4, picking up at second part of verse 4, reading through verse 14. If anyone... Paul says, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, in other words, for pride in the flesh, I have more. Now, again, this is not false humility. He's, he's got the credentials, but he's going to end up saying they don't count for anything. Okay, But he's going to go through his credentials now. Circumcision, yep, on the eighth day. Of the nationality, of the national race of Israel, you want to talk about racial prejudice and pride? Yeah, of Israel. I mean, even of the tribe of Benjamin, those zealous in some ways traditionally. A Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee, a set-apart one. I mean, really a purist. As to zeal, yeah, persecuting the church. I even did that. I'm all in, man. I'm not just sending money. I'm in there for it. As, and here's the, here's the coup de grace now. As to righteousness under the law blameless but but whatever things were gained to me he's talking like an accountant for a moment here but whatever things were gained to me those I have counted as loss the balance sheet is totally shifted now for the sake of Christ yet indeed I therefore count all by implication things as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss. He's not complaining about this. He's rejoicing in this because it's put things into perspective for him. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as garbage. I'll come back to that, scubala. In order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but that through faith from Christ. Christios Christu comes from Christ, what he's done, the righteousness from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, the koinony of his suffering, being conformed to his death, in order that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. No, no, no way. Not Paul. But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. It's one thing we should do as Christians. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, again, let's walk through this with what we've learned from Jesus and from Paul now. By God's word, first of all, drop pride in traditions and status. Whatever status you're proud of, let go of it. I mean, to the extent you have something, use it to serve Christ, but totally subject it to Christ. Drop pride in traditions and status in order to enter the kingdom as a newborn. Jonathan Edwards, the greatest American theologian probably in our history in the United States, he's from the colonial period, great evangelist and theologian. Jonathan Edwards said, spiritual pride is the main door through which the devil enters the hearts of the religiously zealous. Spiritual pride. So here's what I have to say to you and me. 
This is not just like, oh, those poor Pharisees and, you know, scribes, teachers of the law, 2,000 years ago, they really didn't get it. Why did God inspire Luke to write all this and tell us all this? Is it really just for historical reference? No, it's about us too. There's a message here for us. Jesus is warning us about this. Spiritual pride. This is why he says, beware, okay? So, um, what does it mean to let go? Well, when John is talking to a man who clearly should be proud of himself by human flesh standards, right? Nicodemus. He's not only a Pharisee, he's at the highest level of the Sanhedrin, right? In John chapter 3, Jesus says to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born again, you got to start totally over. You're not really impressive and you just add an extra degree by believing in me. It's not like a, an extra postgraduate degree. It's like you got to start all the way from the get-go. Unless you are born again, you cannot even begin to see, there's that word again, to see the kingdom. And over to our gospel we're preaching through right now, Luke 18. Jesus is calling little children to come to him. Remember this? He gets on to his disciples for preventing this. And he says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. In other words, they have nothing. Amen, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Drop pride. Drop status. Come to me. Augustine in his sermon 353 on this passage says, the humble. This is what it means for us, the humble. That is to say, those who are little ones in spirit. Don't despise or shrink from being humble, Augustine says. This littleness is proper to great souls. Pride, on the other hand, is the misleading greatness of the weak. So drop pride in traditions and status. Paul also drops pretty much everything. His pride, his prejudice, his religious and academic pedigree, his special race lines, his religious performance, his scholastic performance. He says, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I do more. And he goes through all his credentials, all the way from religious background, inheritance, pedigree, all the way through what he's done, how brilliant he is, all his commitment and passion. And he says it's all nothing. Um, racial, religious heritage my inheritance, my credentials, my professional accomplishments. Brother, sister, if you are clinging to those for your meaning and identity, you're in big trouble with the Lord. You need to let them go. Use them for him, but subject them to him. So Paul goes on and says this. He goes through all his background. And he says, whatever things were gained to me, I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Yet indeed, I therefore count all things as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And am I bitter about it? Am I disappointed about it? No, catch this. I count them as, the Greek here is scubala. I told you I would come back to that. The nice euphemistic translation is garbage or rubbish. That's what you usually see in English translations. What does that term actually mean? It means human waste, scuvala. It's the only time we see it in the New Testament. It is a bad word, it's a rough word. He says, I count everything, all my background, all my credentials, all my race lines, all my religious traditions as dung compared to Jesus Christ. It's human waste. That's what he just said. If that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. Okay, now number two, flowing from that, drop prideful grudges to be open to grace and generosity. As I said, when Jesus leaves this lunch, they are bitterly and pressingly holding a grudge against Jesus. See, we need to be instead open to grace and generosity. Paul says, in order that I may know Christ and the righteousness that God gives me from the faith of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ, that's what I need. Not my performance, his perfect completion of faith. That's what Paul is looking for. That's what I need. Let me get personal for a moment and ask you, um, you got any grudges? Got any hard feelings toward anybody? Or maybe you look down at other people. They should have done better, right? And maybe they should have. 
But if you want Jesus, you got to drop that. You got to lift it up to him in prayer and let it go. Okay? And third, drop all prideful play acting and presumption. This is what a lot of religious people are really good at. Paul was the master of it. I mean, he looked really good. And he's saying, I'm dropping it. Drop all prideful play acting and presumption. Jesus began to say to his disciples first, what's the first thing he warns them about after this big encounter with the Pharisees and the scribes? Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. A couple things on this. What is leaven? Is it big and massive and explosive like a missile? No, it's little but it starts spreading through the whole loaf, right? Jesus is saying, if you have a little bit of hypocrisy in you, it's going to spread. Well, I'm 99% pretty earnest with Jesus, but, you know, occasionally I kind of play the game a little. No, no, Jesus says, get rid of it. Repent. Crucify it to me. Give it up to me. Because it spreads through all that you are. If you've got mess going on, it's going to spread, okay? Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. They look good. Maybe I want to be like them. No, 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 Jesus says. And then hypocrisy. You know hypocrisy, right? It's from the Greek term for play actors in Greek who wore masks, right? So you're putting on a show. It's not the real you underneath. It's not the real heart and soul of you underneath, but you're looking good. Jesus says... Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is play acting. They do it really well. They know all the scriptures. They're really impressive. They can quote the whole Torah. Can you? They've got all this religious commitment and zeal. They look really good. But ultimately, underneath, they're dead. They're graves, Jesus says. They're dead because the spirit is not in them. And Jesus has dropped the play acting. Drop all prideful play acting and presumption. Hey, I'm, I grew up in the right family. I'm in the right church. I'm in the, the right kind of guy. I've got the, I'm going to drop it all. And here's, the, here's what it means to be a Christian. Here's what it means to live this week for Christ. Brothers, I do not consider I've made it my own. In other words, the resurrection in Christ. Life with Christ forever. The kingdom. Even Paul who's totally clear on salvation in Christ, says, I haven't obtained it all. I, I, I'm still in process. God's still working to me. That's why I'm still here. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do. Here's the one thing you should do in your life today and this week. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. What is the goal? What am I pressing for in my life? The prize. What's the prize? Of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The heavenly call. The heavenward call. That I might live my life heavenward instead of focused on myself. Now, Jesus has already taken hold of me. That's the good news. And that's the sure eternal news. But I am called to let go of other things, including definitely my pride in other things and my presumption, and to reach out to his hand, which has already taken hold of me. That is salvation. That is sanctification. That is the Christian life. That's what Paul is calling us to, the prize. Let go, drop pride to lay hold the prize. I don't know where you are right now, but I'm guessing if you're anything like I am, there are things right now in your life and in your heart, and yes, even things of pride and presumption, that are getting in the way of you truly being at the feet of Jesus right now and walking with him in his way. Whatever those things are, I want to invite you right now to pray and let them go and take the hand of the Lord who takes hold of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, let's pray. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. 
If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.